All right, so yes, I was flown out to LA to go hands-on with Path of Exile 2, and I have returned with hours and hours of brand new gameplay and all new details from game director Jonathan Rogers. That's what we're going to be taking a look at in this video. We're talking about the extensive in-game system, going over pretty much all of it, the Ascendancy class system, what it's like at max level and beyond, a tease at some of the in-game gear that we can acquire, a super detailed look at basically every system in the game, early access details, and yes, you can get access to this game starting at $30, which is absolutely insane to me. More on the new game plus type system related to replaying the campaign. You guys have got to also see how the actual map system works in the in-game. It's pretty cool. And also how this game is going to be starting out massive, but will also be doubling in size from early access until official launch. We're taking a look at some cool boss battles, classes, so much stuff. But by the way, I am doing a Path of Exile 2 giveaway. So for a chance to win early access, see the link in the pinned top comment. Check it out. But we're going to go ahead and see what Jonathan Rogers has to say. This is a very big presentation. By the way, a very special thank you goes out to Grinding Gear Games for their professionalism and providing me with all of this footage, the full-blown presentation for you guys. And remember, I have returned with my own recorded gameplay, so look out for that in the very near future. So yeah, here we go. This is super impressive. Enjoy. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to go through the characters, uh, character classes that you can going to be playing in early access. And while we're doing that, we're going to explain the different ways that you have to develop your character. Now, as I said before, I like to keep things pretty casual. This isn't some kind of hyper-polished presentation. And Octavian, who's playing, is going to be using cheats and so on. So, you know, he might have to die and revive, but uh, hopefully it goes okay. So we're going to start off with the monk. So the monk is a fast melee fighter. He cares a lot about momentum in combat. Um, now, he's... He does a lot of damage, but he isn't necessarily uh, that uh, strong physically uh, in terms of defenses. So uh, you're going to want to stay back and uh, you know go into and out of combat very quickly. Now, like all classes, um, the monk was going to want to mix and match a few different combos. And one of the things we really like to do with our skills is make sure that we've got a lot of things that can take advantage of different situations. In this particular case, Octavian is freezing monsters with uh, this wave of frost, and then he's using Glacial Cascade to uh, kill them uh, if he even hits the thing. If the end of the um, Glacial Cascade hits the monster um, and it's frozen, then it will um, do a uh, AoE damage and, uh, you know, um, well, yeah, do a lot of damage. Now, the monk also has a lot of combo skills. An example, so if you hit monsters using regular attacks, uh, then you'll charge those skills up. An example of this is Tempest Bell. So here we're going to create a bell, uh, and then if you hit the bell, it'll do damage around it. Uh, you can also um, add status ailments to the bell. So for example, you could freeze it like he was doing there, which will add cold damage, but you could also set it on fire or um, do, um, uh, you know, uh, shock it and this, this kind of thing. So that's sort of just like a really quick rundown of the kind of skills you can expect on the monk. But how do you get skills in the first place? Well, the answer to that is skill gems. So the way that you get uh, skill gems are items that you can find in the world. And if you right click on one, uh, you can choose what skill you want to get. Now we're trying to keep the skill system feeling as much as possible simple for our new players. Um, there's two things you can do here. You can either level up an existing skill or you can pick a new one. And that kind of interface is quite familiar. We have added things like tutorial videos for every skill. Frozen locusts will explode when attacked by you or your enemies. Um, but uh, effectively, we just want to make sure we're keeping this simple as possible. Now, what you do once you've got a skill gem is put it into your skill screen, and once you've done that, you can bind it and use it. This particular skill is called Frozen Locust that creates a, um, a, a little ice ball there, and then you can detonate that with your Glacial Cascade if you want, since it counts as a uh, frozen object. Um, um, or the monsters can attack it and explode it that way, or you could use it in front of a boss who's about to slam and explode it that way. So that's a sort of basic rundown on how you get skills. But it's worth mentioning that um, you can also use skills across other classes as well. So um, what we saw there was just the skills for this one class. If we open up the screen again, you can see that the skills for the other classes are still available. If, um, you, can, if you have the stats to use them, you can use them just as well. Um, and then there's lots of different interesting combinations you can use across classes too. So that's just a quick rundown on what you can expect for the monk. Uh, now we're going to move on to the sorceress. So the sorceress is our primary uh, elemental spellcaster. Um, she's going to attack mostly from range. Um, she has high damage but low survivability. Um, the area we're entering here is in Act 3 called the Forge. Um, this is an area like an ancient uh, Val forge where they were making uh, various, uh, you know, forging various gold things. So 
So she's um, using a combination of lightning and fire here. Um, once again, there's lots of interesting combos that um, we want to do, but one of the things that I'd really like to kind of show you um, to get a taste for one of the other character development areas we have in PoE2 is uh, support gems. So support gems are, um, in PoE2, you get them by finding an uncut support. And when you open this by default, what you're going to see is um, just a few recommendations. If you go through the different skills that you have on the left, uh, there's different recommended skill gems for each, um, uh, for each skill that you have. Um, so what we're trying to do is just uh, make sure that for new players, it's very easy for them to pick something that's just going to work. In this case, what we might do for Spark is pick Pierce. Um, the reason why that's good is because Spark is a skill that creates a lot of projectiles that uh, run around the ground and then bounce off walls. Um, if we're able to pierce through monsters, it means that they can bounce off a wall and potentially hit a monster again. Um, so that can make it a lot more powerful when you are filling up areas with uh, things like that. Um, we're going to try and relight up the forge here uh, in order to uh, be able to get to the boss. So uh, that's what uh, Octavian's doing here. So um, one of the other things that we might want to um, uh, pick is uh, multiple projectiles for one of our skills. So for example, we've got fireball. Um, if you fire it without uh, multiple projectiles, you uh, get a single fireball that explodes, uh, throw multiple projectiles on there, and uh, you know, obviously it does what you might expect. You get multiple fireballs. So um, the, one of the things that's important is that you can actually move these skill gem, support gems around between skills. For example, we took the multiple projectiles and instead we put it on, um, I don't know, this ice, I think you've got an ice skill somewhere, uh, Frostbolt, uh, then you'd be able to um, make that into multiple projectiles instead. So um, effectively, this is um, the way the, uh, another, another area of character progression that you can use uh, in order to um, improve your characters in PoE. So uh, you want to, I think there was another one as well actually, yeah, oh yeah, Firewall, let's try Firewall. So Firewall is a skill that um, allows you to um, create a wall of fire. If you fire projectiles through that, um, it's going to add fire to the lightning projectiles that we fire through. Um, so that is um, quite a nice uh, little, little combo there as well. But if we want, um, there's another skill, a support gem I think is quite interesting called Fortress. If you throw that on any skill that creates a wall, um, was that the one? Yep. Then uh, when you cast it, it's going to make a uh, circle, which you can either put around you or around the monster. Um, so that means you can cast that and then fire in all directions afterwards. So, um, you know, it can add, add a little bit of power. Uh, it might be a little bit easier in this area as well when you've got uh, tight quarters. All right. Now the next thing we're going to show is the warrior. So the warrior is our um, kind of big tanky melee class. Um, unlike the monk, um, he's a lot slower, but he hits a lot harder. He's just going to change to WASD, which works a bit better on this class. Right, so here's the warrior. Now at the moment he's using a two-hand weapon, so um, he's going to uh, be uh, hitting very slow, um, but uh, very hard. But there's also something else you can do as well in PoE 2, which we didn't have in PoE 1, um, which is that um, if you switch to a shield and a one-hand um, item, um, then uh, you've also got active block. So um, and, uh, this is something that actually comes in handy. It's not so useful for just regular trash monsters unless they've got some special ability, but it can be quite nice against bosses. So let's have a quick look at that. So this is a big boss here. And the thing with bosses, they have large telegraphed attacks. So um, if you use active block here, you can use that to avoid all damage from the front, uh, which is quite nice. Now there are attacks that um, uh, have a little red flash that you can't block, um, but for the most part you can. I need more time. Now, one of the key areas that we haven't talked about yet in Path of Exile in terms of character customization is, of course, the passive tree. 
So Path of Exile is really well known for having a giant passive tree. There's 1,500 nodes in the passive tree, and all the classes use the same tree. However, they start in different locations. So the warrior, for example, starts on the bottom left side here, and because of the fact he starts there, he gets access to a lot more of the uh, melee-focused uh, elements on the tree. Now to quickly explain how the passive tree works, um, there are a few different types of nodes here. Um, the smallest nodes um, are just like minor nodes, and they'll give very simple increases, like for example, you've just got melee damage here and that kind of thing. Uh, but the thing you're probably gonna want to go for are called um, uh, notables. Notables are the very slightly larger nodes, and they have much more interesting effects. Um, they're often gonna depend a little bit on what kind of build you're doing. For example, this one here is 20% more damage against heavy stunned enemies with maces. This is something you're obviously only gonna care about if you're heavy stunning enemies a lot, and of course using maces. So a lot of these notables are the things that are really gonna define your character, and the list of notables is really when it comes to you know, making build guides and things, is you know, this is what's, what really matters. And in POE2, have really tried to push the fact that notables are a lot more interesting, so there's a lot more stuff going on with them. Um, but as well as notables, there's also um, uh, other big nodes on the tree called keystones. And keystones are unique because they have both upsides and downsides. So an example of one right here is called Giant's Blood. It says you can wield two hand axes, maces, and swords in one hand, but you get double attribute requirements of weapons. So effectively, if you want to use a giant two-hand sword, but you still want to use a shield, you've got a way to do that. You just have to meet the attribute requirements to do it, uh, which could be tri tricky for in-game bases. There's also other keystones, a few examples from other classes. There's one here that um, is you know, from POE 1. Maximum life becomes one, but you're immune to chaos damage. Since chaos damage does uh, double damage to uh, energy shield, this is something that you might want to use. Uh, once you've got that, you don't have to worry about chaos damage anymore. You just need to build for energy shield and not life. Um, or another example of one that's been modified from POE 1 is mind over matter. All damage is taken from mana before life but you have 50% less mana recovery rate. If you're gonna build for this, it means you don't have to worry about life once again, but um, you will have to build a huge amount of mana pool in order to sustain that. So these are the kind of things that you can pick um, from keystones that, um, as I said, have upsides and downsides and interesting trade-offs. Now there is one other mechanic as well that I wanna quickly talk about. So if you go back to the character and just have a look, um, uh, Octavian was manually switching between, uh, if you go back to the character um, and see, so Octavian was manually switching between one hand and two handed weapon sets. He was just pressing X to do that. Um, and uh, when he's using both sets, there are uh, things on the passive tree that you might want to be able to use um, uh, for, for one or the other. So another unique feature of a POE2 on the passive tree is the ability to split passives in two uh, in order to allocate one for one set and another set for the other. So if we allocate ones in red here, um, these passives will only be used when you've got a two hand weapon. And if you allocate passives in green using the other one here, these passives will only be allocated when you're holding the other weapon set, when, using, when he's using his one hand weapon. So effectively, if he presses the weapon swap button now, it'll switch from one set to the other. Um, so that means that he can um, effectively dynamically adjust his passives based on um, what weapon sets he wants to use. But the other thing as well is in order to make it a lot easier for you to be able to use uh, different uh, uh, passives in your, um, sorry, different passives and different weapons for different skills, we also have the ability to pick for a given skill which uh, weapon set you want to use it with. So for example, the stampede skill here, um, if you've got a shield, um, then when you use the skill, it will um, call, be blocking the entire time, if you just demonstrate that quickly. Um, so if you use a um, stampede, uh, because you hold your shield in front of you, you're blocking the entire time you're charging. And uh, using the one-hand weapon will also be a lot faster because it's got higher attack speed. So that's something we'd much rather use with our one-hand weapon. But when, for example, we're doing our Earthquake or our um, Double Slam, this is something that we probably only want to use with our two-hand weapon because we want to do the most, most damage. So that means we can turn it off with the other weapon set. And now when you use your uh, two-hand, uh, now when you use that, it'll switch to your two-hand weapon automatically. So effectively, this allows you to um, have multiple weapon sets and do a lot of different things. It's also very good for, um, you know, for example, on the uh, uh, sorceress earlier, she was using lightning and fire. Um, you know, she can have two different staffs, one that's geared for one, one that's geared for the other, as well as spec a passive tree out as well. Um, so that's another character development feature that we have in um, POE2. Next up, we want to talk about the uh, ranger. So the ranger is our primary bow cast, uh, you know, bow user. Um, and she's all about range and mobility. So um, one of the first things we did when we were um, developing the Ranger is we wanted to make sure that everything you do can be done while moving. Um, so this just makes the game feel a lot more fluid. So she's just a lot more mobile even from that. Um, but she also has a lot of vaulting skills that allow her to jump up. For example, there's one there that like uh, freezes uh, monsters. She jumps up and she can jump over monsters and freeze them. Um, so this kind of thing um, allows you to, um, you know, yeah, as I said, feel a lot more mobile in combat. Make sure you can get away from the monsters which you need to do since, um, you know, she isn't necessarily the most tanky character. Now one of the things you might have noticed if you're a POE 1 player is the bottom left of the screen there, there's only two flasks, just a life and a mana flask. 
We've actually changed how the flask system works in PoE2 very recently. Now you get one life and one mana flask, and that's all. And that, the reason we actually did that is we found that uh, there was a problem in PoE1 called flask piano, where everyone was just sitting there pressing one, two, three, five constantly uh, flasking. Um, the thing is, so um, we've actually found we've actually buffed uh, flasks significantly, so that each flask has a lot more charges, but um, they, uh, you only get one of each type. Now, one of the main things that people were doing in PoE One when they were using flasks is they had um, other they were using the other flask slots for uh, mostly things that were making them resistant to various element types and so on. Um, and so we wanted to have a system to allow that to still be the case and still have interesting character customization there. So we've added a new type of um, item called charms. Charms charge up using flask charges, so as you kill monsters, but they automatically trigger in order to grant you immunity to certain things at the point when you get those things. So for example here, this is used when you become ignited and then grants immunity to ignite. So if you're having trouble with fire damage, um, then you can throw that on there. If you get ignited, it'll automatically uh, quench you um, and then it will charge up again uh, from killing monsters. Now there are lots of different charms that have different um, uh, diff different uh, abilities. They trigger on different things. They um, uh, get you. Uh, they, they make you resistant to different things. And they can also get mods, uh, you know, that um, from crafting and so on. So you can uh, make them an interesting part of your build. Um, but the point is, they're always automatic. You don't have to manually trigger them. So it kind of solves that problem of having to manually uh, use flasks constantly. Uh, you get the ability to use more charms by getting higher level belts. Um, this is um, relatively lower level, so you've only got one charm slot there. As you get um, higher level belts, you get more slots up to three. And there might even be some uniques that lead to uh, more charms later on as well, of course. Now, one of the other things that um, we wanted to upgrade as well is that we found, so in PoE2, there's a huge amount of enco encounters and bosses. There are actually uh, 50 bosses in early access. There's gonna be 100 in the final game. Um, and uh, one, so one of the things we've changed is we've upgraded the map to actually allow you to see all of those on the map. So if you zoom in a little bit there, um, you can see um, that there's uh, a bunch of uh, uh, bosses and random encounters around the area. Uh, near to where Octavian is right now, you can see that there's a boss um, called uh, Silver Black Black Fist. Um, and that means that in this area, there's something to um, um, something to find a boss to encounter. So um, yeah, as I said, the bosses uh, often have uh, uh, things that you can use to um, increase your character power as well. So it's important to kill them. So as you can see, he dropped a book of specialization there. And this is one of the items that allows you to do the split passive points on the passive tree, but it also gives you more passive points as well. So it's something that you're gonna definitely want to find. Now there are other bosses around the game that have different bonuses and so on, so it's definitely a good idea to explore all the encounters throughout the game and uh, find all of those things. So next we're gonna talk about the witch. And uh, while we're showing the witch, um, it's also a good time to talk about one of the other character progression systems in Path of Exile 2, uh, which is Spirit. So the witch is a primary summoner, but she also has a range of other supporting skills. But the thing we want to show you first is just the fact that um, she uh, often, and in fact all the classes use a resource called Spirit. So there's a new type of skill gem, an uncut spirit gem, which you can use here. And that'll um, give you a bunch of these, uh, uh, another skill screen with a bunch more abilities. Um, what these ones are is um, for giving you things that are kind of somewhere halfway between a passive bonus and an active one. Um, this one here called Grim Feast um, feeds on corpses to bolster your energy shield. Um, but we've got lots of these for all classes. All classes can use them. For example, on Sorceress uh, here, you've got Outer Armor. There's one here called Raging Spirits, which um, means that every time you use a fire skill, it summons a uh, Raging Spirit. Um, so you can, like, as I said, it's somewhere between like an active and a passive. Um, but uh, for the uh, minion characters in particular, they're going to want to get a lot of spirit because um, all minions are paid for um, with, uh, with, the, with the same resource. So um, what we're going to do here is um, in, order to, uh, in order to use spirit, effectively what you do is you go to the skill screen and if you've got minions there, you can just click the little plus button, uh, get some extra minions and um, there you go. Now, these are permanent minions, which means that if they die, um, they're going to respawn again automatically. You don't have to spawn them constantly. Um, and that means that it's, uh, during boss fights and things like that, 
It makes it a, um, uh, a, a lot easier. You don't have to worry about having to have corpses every time, that kind of thing. But we also do want to support large minion armies, and because of that, we also have uh, minion skills that you can summon from corpses as well. So all these little scorpions here, um, those are summoned from corpses. Uh, while you're clearing, you'll get large armies. Um, during boss fights, it'll be a little bit more focused uh, using the uh, minions, uh, the, your permanent minions for the most part. Now he's also got some other supporting skills, uh, a lot of uh, things focusing on chaos damage. So um, he's got a skill called Contagion that'll spread between monsters and um, other things like Essence Drain and so on, like just a, a, a few other chaos damaging skills. Now the other thing with minions is that all the permanent minions come with extra abilities uh, that you can trigger manually. So you see those little uh, markers on your minions, um, you can use those to explode your minions. So that's the Arsonists, uh, it's their ability. They'll throw a little bomb and explode your minion. Um, and uh, there's, also, there's also other ones. For example, the uh, snipers have the ability to create little gas clouds. And uh, the more minions you have, the more often you can use those abilities. So effectively, it means that each minion also effectively serves as an extra skill as well as being a, uh, a meat shield for you as well. That's a quick introduction to the, um, to the witch. Um, but now we're gonna show off the mercenary. Oh, actually, wait, no, we did miss something. Sorry about that. <laughs> right, so just one other quick thing I wanted to show you as well is that um, the, the witch has a lot of other summoning options even beyond just the ones that were picked because she also has uh, things called specters. So basically, anytime you kill a monster on the ground, it can be turned into a specter. We've actually created one here from Act 1 called a Cultist Archer. Um, they cost quite a bit of spirit, so we're going to unsummon a couple of the arsonists and put these, uh, this Cultist Archer in. Now the nice thing is, is that because lots of uh, monsters in Path of Exile have different interesting abilities, there's all those abilities can be used by the summoner as well. So this one has the ability to summon these uh, like purple polyp things that both slow monsters and um, add uh, weakness to chaos damage as well. Um, so uh, she's hopefully yeah she's using it there with those little things that um, exploded there. Um, because those are going to make monsters uh, weaker to uh, chaos damage, it'll be a, a very good part of this build. Um, it's not as many minions, but the nice thing is, is that um, it'll actually end up being more DPS, and I think for bosses it probably is better for this build than not. That's what these uh, little pilot things are. All right, so moving on. Let's uh, have a look, quick look at the mercenary. So the mercenary is another ranged character, but this time using crossbows. Now the main difference between a crossbow and a bow is that crossbows fire instantly, and they also have an ammo mechanic where effectively, you know, you fire until your clip is empty and then you have to reload. So it plays a lot more like an FPS. And we've got lots of type of FPS type um, weapons as well. I uh, just changed it to WASD here because this character plays a lot better in that way. So if you've got like a, a um, shotgun type weapon, um, uh, you've got a uh, assault rifle type weapon. Uh, let me find some monsters. Uh, and various other types. You've also got attached grenade launchers um, and uh, things like sniper rifle type weapons and so on. Now, this um, plays very differently to the other classes, um, but I think it's really fun. Um, it's just like a whole different sort of feeling of the game. Um, this particular area is called Doyani's Sanctum. Um, he's uh, doing a lot of experiments on humans and, uh, you know, is very interested in anatomy and kind of merging them with machines. Uh, there's a pretty interesting chest on the wall there that I quite like, uh, if you click on that one. <laughs> Just, uh, so there's a cadaver on the wall and it like slices up and uh, it drops some items. So um, that's kind of fun. <laughs> we actually originally just had half a person there, but it really just looked like an anatomy diagram. So we needed to do something to show the fact that it was actually a modeled human there. So uh, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> so um, yeah. So um, uh, one of the other things we haven't even talked about, which is another really important character development system in Path of Exile is of course items. So. Now, items in Path of Exile work like many other action RPGs, but I think that we do a particularly good job of having, um, you know, interesting affixes and suffixes. If you have a look at the items on the character, um, you know, like they effectively, they generate, um, we have uh, normal magic, rare, and uniques. Uh, magic items can have up to two mods. Uh, rare items can have up to six. Um, and effectively, um, each of the different slots had, um, has a pool of mods that's unique to it. Um, but one of the other things that's sort of really important about PO is crafting items. So here we have um, different crafting items that allow you to add affixes to items. Um, if you use an orb of transmutation, it'll turn um, this uh, magic item to a one mod magic. If you use an orb of augmentation, it'll add an extra mod to make it into a two mod magic. You've also got regal orbs that will turn it into a three mod rare, um, which is normally, um, uh, normally that I have four, but if you do it this way, you get three. And then you can use exalted orbs to add more mods than that to make up to six mods. 
Now, something in Path of Exile 2 that's very different than POE 1 is that these currency items to add mods to items are much, much more common than they were before. And you're really going to be expected to use them throughout the campaign. It's like a really important element of player power. We've actually changed the way the scaling works in quite a lot of elements to kind of try and make it so that um, picking up a, a, like new blue items is going to actually be an interesting choice for you. Using, a, uh, using regals and exalts in them are uh, pretty interesting. And also, you get regals um, by selling, uh, by disenchanting rares as well. So effectively, you can. Um, um, get quite a lot of regals in order to upgrade items to, um, to rares uh, relatively easily. So now these crafting items, the other thing that's important about them is you can use them on any base type, not just um, items you can equip. Uh, they're used throughout the game for many different purposes, for the end game as well, and many other things. So uh, you, can, you, know, you can use them on flasks and charms. There's all sorts of places where you can use them. So uh, it's definitely something that you're going to want to master and uh, play around with. Now the other items, of course, that we have is lots and lots of unique items. Um, there are hundreds of them in POE 2. There'll be hundreds and hundreds more as we go along. Um, and um, you know, some of them are pretty interesting. They all do things. They aren't just upgraded rares. They all do something kind of interesting. So for example, here we have a boots called Corpse Wade. Um, if you put that on there and then you walk through a corpse, um, it'll make them explode and turn into little puffs of uh, green uh, uh, chaos damage there. Uh, that's not something you're going to get on a rare item. Uh, another one here is called um, uh, Sands of Silk. Uh, if you put this one on, what it's going to do is change your dodge roll into a teleport uh, into a blip that can blink through monsters. Um, once again, not something you get on a rare. But there's you know, a few others here that are kind of interesting. Um, this one, next one here is called Couture of Crimson. It makes life leech overflow maximum life. So as you attack monsters, you can get like over health um, above your normal maximum um, if you're using life leech. Um, another one here, for example, uh, pretty simple in some ways, is Quill Rain. Uh, this thing here just has ridiculous attack speed, if you, um, but low damage. If you want to make an interesting bow build where you're just making, uh, where you want to hit huge amounts of times, don't necessarily care about the damage dealt, Quill Rain is going to be something for you. Um, or another one here called the Wailing Wall. Um, this one here disables shield skills, but makes you able to block damage from all hits without having to raise your shield. Uh, so effectively, if you want to be able to um, yeah, block a lot of damage, but you don't care about being able to use other shield skills, uh, this could be a good one. So all of these are what we call build enabling. They're interesting things that you might be able to build a character around, um, do something interesting with, um, and they're a big part of um, how the end game, uh, so, you know, in -game, things that you can find at end game, uh, things that you're gonna be sort of going throughout the game, things that might uh, affect how your character is played. So, on the eve of the end, the demon of Atzoatl has finally come for me! I bear the burden of our future! Pathetic! the means. Let's see how you handle this. I can't give up. Not now. The cataclysm must be stopped. So you would take our devices and doom us? I think not. I will fight to the... Listen, I'm just here for the lady. There's no need for all this. I've got you now!
All right. So, so far we've been showing you footage from the campaign. One of the really important things in any action RPG is the end game. Now, something that happens almost every time a new action RPG launches is people saying there isn't enough end game content. We really want to make sure that in POE 2, people don't feel that way. And it's something that we actually changed our priorities for as a studio relatively recently. Now, the first three acts of POE 2 take around 25 hours to complete. This is already longer than many campaigns and other games. On the other hand, people spend hundreds of hours in endgame. We realized that finishing the rest of their campaign for early access instead of working on endgame would actually be a very bad idea. So instead of having acts four to six in early access, it's much better for us to concentrate on endgame and make that great. If you're a new player, a 25-hour campaign is already a huge game with plenty of content. But if you're an existing action RPG player, then what you're going to care about is the endgame challenges that you have to complete. If we'd launched with a double-length campaign and a bad endgame, we'd effectively have to say, hey, trust us, a good endgame is coming later. But if we launch with a 25-hour campaign and a great endgame, then people can easily understand what's coming when we say, oh, yeah, and there's three more acts coming really soon. Now, in early access, there are 50 bosses currently and around 400 monster types. But effectively, the game is going to double in size during early access and to be six acts with uh, 100 bosses and you know, around 800 monster types. Now, the great thing is the rest of the game is like 80% there. And so we'll be adding content very quickly during early access. And so you can expect to see a lot of that coming really quickly. Now, in order to make the end game happen at the same player level, we've had to add a second difficulty called Cruel Difficulty, where you repeat the campaign with all the monsters and bosses harder, but also better rewards. If you sort of look at it in traditional game terms, you can think of it as a kind of like New Game Plus type thing. But we've actually made quite a lot of changes to the game throughout as well, which uh, you'll probably enjoy as well. And that'll take you to around level 65, which is where the end game begins. So let's talk about what the end game is. So in POE, there are many different end game grinds. One of the things that's kind of really important um, is that people feel like they've got a choice between many different types of activities in the end game. So for POE 2, at the start of early access, we're going to have eight primary end game grinds that you can do, all of which have their own sort of systems for leveling them up, improving them, unique rewards, player power that you can get only from them. And uh, we're going to introduce the first two of them uh, right here um, uh, uh, during the campaign, um, which are the Ascension Trials. So the Ascension Trials in Path of Exile 2, um, are, uh, you, you do encounter them in the campaign to start with, but then um, they level up all the way to end game and they have interesting mechanics. So this first one here is called The Trial um, of the Sacamas, and it's actually a sequel to Sanctum League uh, from, POE, uh, from POE 1. So uh, we've actually done quite a lot of sequels to leagues from POE 1 um, with uh, new mechanics and new, uh, new stuff, but all of them have new things going on. So basically, in order to um, the, second, uh, the trial of the Sekimers is um, a place where the Maraketh came to be tested and gain power. In order to gain entry, you need a, uh, a coin containing the soul of a jinn. Um, and then once you put it in the relic altar there, then you can enter and, um, and um, start playing. Now, the trial, the, uh, the, the trial is made up of um, various different rooms, um, all, and, and it works a little bit like a, um, a roguelike type encounter system, where effectively you pick each room, um, and then uh, in, within each room there's a different challenge. This one is a uh, ritual trial, I think, which uh, uh, has these uh, monster summoners. So they're effectively summoning uh, monsters, and you want to be able to kill those as fast as you can to complete the room. That one was relatively easy. So once you've completed the room, you can go into the next room to get your reward. Now in this case, we have a silver key. Keys can be used at the end of the, um, of the trial to be able to get um, uh, rewards. But effectively, you have to be able to survive the entire trial to be able to claim them. Now this is the map for the uh, trial, and you can effectively pick what type of uh, room you'd like to go to next. Um, there, now there are a few different issues. One of them is that um, you, uh, the next room will have a type, uh, so for a type of trial. For example, here's an hourglass trial. And it also has a type of reward. But also some of them have um, boons or afflictions that might get you. So this one says, for example, when you enter it, that it'll afflict you with blunt sword on entry, um, which means you and your minions deal 40% less damage. We probably don't want to do that as a minion build. Um, but uh, they have better rewards in exchange for that. So once you've picked your room, you can go and do, uh, go, uh, go and do the next one. Now this one's a time trial. You have to survive for uh, and kill all the monsters. Now one thing that I didn't mention at the start of this is that unlike uh, in the normal game, if you take hits in uh, this mode, um, then you're going to lose a resource called honor. Uh, if you run out of honor, then you have to uh, leave the trial. 
Um, so effectively, you want to really try and play these runs as hitless as possible. And that means that all the monsters we've selected um, usually have to be avoidable in some way, have dodgeable mechanics. And uh, that's sort of why uh, Octavian is playing as safely as he possibly can here. He doesn't want to get too close to the boss uh, or the, that, that monster there um, because uh, he doesn't want to lose honor. Oh, yes, it is. Okay. No, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Okay, All right. So once the trial is complete, once again, you can go and get the reward, which in this case is a bronze key again because we picked one that had the same reward. Uh, we'll do one more. So uh, that one's a sacred water fountain, the chalice trial. Uh, yeah, sure, let's do it. All right, cool. Uh, the next one's called a chalice trial. Uh, effectively, there's a, um, a blood chalice here, um, which, has, uh, which you need to fill with blood by killing rare monsters in this area. Once you've killed all the rare monsters, you can continue. Now, there are a lot of different rooms in, um, uh, in, 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 in uh, the trial. Um, there are around 70 in uh, level one, and they're random, what you get each time. So um, you should expect each run to feel quite different, and uh, the kind of stuff you can expect to find, you know, the kind of boons and afflictions you get, um, the monsters that you'll face, this kind of thing, all of these are very different. And there's also uh, four floors as well. This is just the first floor. Um, each floor looks different and has uh, different mechanics, rewards, and so on as well. Um, so there's quite a lot of content here. Um, and once again, like I said, there's got to be ways as well for it to sort of expand into end game, have more, um, uh, uh, you know, have ways to expand it and uh, ways to uh, make it both, both more uh, damaging and more important. Where is that other rare? There he is. Avoid that one. <laughs> Alright, so that's this trial complete. And once again, you can get the reward you picked, which I believe was Sacred Water in this case. So Sacred Water is a resource that you can use throughout your run. Um, effectively, it's a currency that can be used in um, a shop that you can find throughout the uh, run as well. Uh, water is obviously a very uh, hard resource in the desert. So in the interest of time, what we're going to do now is skip to the last um, uh, uh, room in this floor of the Sanctum, uh, which is a boss room. Formidable. Steal yourself. Alright, so now we have Rattle Cage. So that's the boss of the end of the first floor of the Sanctum, but there's lots more bosses in Sanctum to find. Um, as I said, there's multiple floors, um, they each have interesting things. 
Now at the end of each floor, you'll get the ability to pick from various different chests. The keys that drop um, give the ability to open these, um, these caches here. Um, so you want to pick which one because each of them have different, uh, uh, different types of rewards in them. Now the other thing that you get to do here is use the Altar of Ascendancy. Um, now, unfortunately, we forgot to reset the Ascendancy class, so you're not going to be able to see the uh, list there um, when we did the thing before. But effectively, once you've um, the first time you uh, use the order of Ascendancy, you get to pick between um, three different Ascendancy classes. In early access, there's only going to be two available for each class, um, and we're going to be adding the rest later. And those give you interesting uh, things that are only available to your class, because uh, no other class gets those things on the passive tree. Now, with the Senacy classes in PeeWee 2, we've really tried to do a lot better in terms of how interesting the things are. For example, um, this particular class, and because I can't see the name on the screen, I forgot what it's called, Infernalist, right? <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's got some pretty interesting abilities. One of them here is called the Hellhound. So this one gives the ability to summon a Hellhound. Um, when you summon it, um, it uh, has a few abilities. One of them is, is that it sets everything next to it on fire. It's a minion, so because we're a minion class, this can be um, really useful. Um, but also it takes damage for you. Every time you take damage, it gets transferred to the Hellhound. Um, so, you know, he's a really good boy. Uh, another one that's really interesting is that, um, uh, if we just respec quickly uh, away from that, um, is uh, turning into a uh, de uh, de called demon form. So when you use uh, demon form, you turn into a demon. Uh, while you're a demon, you lose life constantly, um, but you also uh, have much uh, higher spell damage and uh, much uh, faster cast speed. Um, the longer you survive, um, the uh, higher those numbers get. So uh, uh, you know, but you're going to continuously take damage. So you're probably, if you're going to use this, you probably want to do a build that involves getting high life regeneration in some manner, um, so you can survive as long as possible and do a large amount of um, do a large amount of damage. So that's an example of just two nodes from the Infernalist. Um, but of course, um, you know, there's lots of interesting nodes there. And um, you're going to want to uh, ascend, get more points by doing more ascension trials. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, continue to uh, get more player power. Now in PoE 2, you actually, uh, all of the ascension trials. Um, oh, that's right. Sorry, we haven't even finished this one yet. All right, hang on. Where was I? All right, that's right. Okay, so let's talk about how this extends into endgame. So effectively, as you go through um, uh, this trial, you might find items called relics. And uh, relics are these items here, which can be crafted. Um, you can see an example of a blue one here. This one says monsters have a 4% chance to uh, drop double sacred water and gain 16 sacred water at the start of the trial. Now, these are ways that you can effectively improve your odds um, as you go through. But there's some pretty interesting ones as well. Let's have another look at another couple. Um, bosses deal 4% uh, deal reduced damage. These ones are very low level and simple, but um, they can get quite powerful. If you click on the relic altar um, before you start your run, um, put a coin in. Um, then you've got these slots here that you can put the relics in. Um, and you can also unlock more slots by doing more, uh, sorry, uh, by doing this more uh, in order to be able to put more in. There are also unique relics, like for example this one here that um, says that the boss at the end of the entire um, trial will drop a specific unique item, but your maximum honor is one, which means you can take exactly one hit, uh, which means that you need to do a hitless run in order to be able to uh, uh, get that unique. Um, so there are lots of other interesting unique relics that do other things. Um, you know, the ability to extend this and uh, get into endgame is pretty high. And uh, one of the reasons you're going to want to do that is because um, like all of these different endgame mechanics, there's unique player power that only comes from it. So in this particular case, we have jewels. Um, jewels are coming back in PoE2 as well. Um, you can see an example of one of them here. These are things that you can socket into your passive tree to be able to um, get, more, um, uh, get, get more stats. So this one says 15% increased maximum energy shield and minions have plus 7% to all elemental resistances. Now because of the fact that you can roll these yourself and stack them, there's some pretty interesting things you can do with jewels. And there's also jewels that have other kind of random and weird effects. Like for example, this one here says upgrades, uh, sorry, um, says that 25% um, increased effect of small passive skills and radius. So this one actually modifies the other skills on the passive tree to improve them. Um, and uh, you know, you, with some interesting things and some interesting overlaps, you can do some pretty cool stuff with those as well. There are of course unique jewels and other things going on. And um, I won't go too much into it, but effectively this does scale all the way in game, has uniques, has ways to scale it, uh, and a lot of interesting things you can do. Um, the next trial we're gonna talk about is the trial of the Chaos God. Now, unlike in PoE 1, um, every time you want to get more uh, Ascendancy points, there's a new trial um, that you have to do to, to do that. Um, so this is the second trial um, that you can do. And once again, it's also an in-game mechanic that, um, uh, that can be expanded upon. Um, so we're going to use the Mercenary for this one. Um, now, this is the one you're going to encounter in Act 3 for the first time. But as I said, it extends to in-game as well. Um, finishing the Ascension Trial was kind of an ancient rite for the Vile that conveyed power and respect. Um, entry requires a token from a strange entity called the Trial Master. And this is actually a sequel to a league from PoE 1 called Ultimatum, uh, but it works very differently. So um, to start with, um, he's going to offer the trial. 
um, offer, make the offering to the trial, and then you can walk in. Now, before you enter each room in um, the uh, trial of the Chaos God, you're going to have to pick from one of the downsides that's going to affect you for the entire rest of the trial. So the trial master is here, and he's going to offer you an item to start with. Here's the item that you're going to get if you uh, complete this room. And he's also going to say, pick one of these three things that's going to potentially hurt you. Uh, in this case, we're going to pick blood gobules, which will um, one of the easier ones. And what that's going to do is make, mean that um, uh, these blood balls are going to appear above your head and slam down periodically. Are you ready? Challenger. As you walk into the room, he's going to summon a bunch of these monsters. Now, each of the rooms has different mechanics. This one's very simple. You just have to kill all the monsters. Not That's that blood globule I talked about earlier. Now the blood gobble may not seem very threatening right now, but as you go through each room, you're going to add more and more mechanics that are going to hurt you, and so it can get quite intense by the time you've gone to the end. One Who's next? There we go. So we've defeated all the monsters in this room, and we can move on to the next one. So as we move to the next room, once again, the trial master is going to give us a choice, basically sort of double or nothing. Do you want to take another reward um, and, uh, and, and make, make the game harder again? Um, or do you want to take the rewards you've already received so far and, uh, and leave with your ill-gotten gains? Uh, in this case, obviously, like most players, you're probably going to want to pick another reward and keep going. So there's the existing one, Blood Gobules, and that'll keep stacking up. But we're also going to have Shocking Turrets here, which are going to add turrets through the, um, through the room, which uh, you'll have to deal with as well. Now, this one is uh, a uh, trial that requires, uh, it's a timed, timed encounter type trial. Live. As you can see, there's those lightning turrets there now, which you also have to deal with. And it's going to spawn a lot of monsters that you have to survive. You don't have to actually kill all of them. Uh, if the time runs out, then they're all going to go away. So uh, yeah, you can, um, you just have to survive. And the Vile had a culture of risk-taking, so all these kind of risk versus reward mechanics uh, very much uh, work for them. Um, the way they crafted and a bunch of other things like that all sort of relate to this kind of risk-taking behavior. He's stuck. Uh-oh. You've only got four seconds. Just survive for four seconds. Yeah. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Managed to uh, flask through it, so it's okay. So as you get towards the end game, um, there'll be a very significant number of rooms you can do in a row. Um, I, I mean, uh, you can just keep on making it harder and harder. Um, in this first uh, version of it, um, you're going to. Um, uh, in this first version of it, um, you only have to do four rooms to be able to ascend. But once again, if you can't do them all in a row in one go without dying, um, then you'll lose your um, entry ticket, so you'll have to get another one to get in. So once again, like the other challenge, uh, you'll want to be um, make sure that you're ready before you do this trial. Now this particular one involves pushing this idol forward. When you're near the idol, it moves forward. Um, when you're, um, as you get um, further away, it falls down and doesn't move anymore. So uh, ideally, you can get close to it. Now, as you move it forward, it's also going to spawn these, uh, trigger these monster elevators um, with monsters that are going to come down as well. Not Alright, finally. That one dragged a little bit, but it's okay. We finally got there in the end. 
All right. So um, just like in Sanctum, there are also bosses that you can get as you go through here. The order of them is random, um, and so it can some, they can be very hard or relatively easy depending on when you encounter them and what things that you've picked beforehand. Um, before the boss, once again, the trial master will ask you to pick, uh, you know, do you want to bail now or do you want to uh, pick something else? So here's, the, um, here's one of the bosses uh, you can find in the Trial of the Chaos God. will bring you to your end. Tornado has killed him the most times in practices, by the way. It's lethal. So that's as far as we're going to go in this uh, trial for now um, at this low level. And of course, once again, you'd be able to um, uh, ascend here if this is as far as you can get uh, during the campaign. Um, but um, it, uh, there's a lot more stuff you can get. So the trial master now is going to give you the rewards that you've earned throughout the trial. And there are a lot of rewards that are unique just to, um, uh, ju just to this trial. So let's go through a few of these that we've got here. Now the first thing he's going to offer, um, one of the things we've got here is an item with a socket in it. Now. We've actually we removed our gem sockets from POE2, but we've actually re-added back sockets uh, in, the, in a much more traditional way um, as things that you can put items in to get extra mods. So if you have a look down the left there, you can see a thing called a soul core. This is a soul core of thunder. Um, if you put it in a weapon, you get uh, lightning damage. If you put it in a shield, then uh, or sorry, an armor, you're going to get 10% um, lightning resistance. Now this is player power. You can't get any other way than sockets, and it's only unlocked through content um, that you can get uh, through here. Now, if you want to be able to actually add sockets to existing gear as opposed to using the sockets that are on gear that you get from here, you're going to have to use these things called Val Orbs. Val Orbs modify things unpredictably and they work a little bit differently than they used to in POE 1. Now, the first thing I want to mention is the fact that these corrupt items, and what that means is that after you've used this, you can't use it on another um, item again. Um, so that's the last thing you want to do in your crafting step. Um, this particular one here rolled with a, it got an extra mod, it got uh, 14 to 20 chaos damage as an extra mod as well as getting corrupted. But they can also do other things. So we'll use it on some of our gear here. Uh, you can equip it, I think you can leave it equipped. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to use it on his, on his bow here. Um, okay, so that one gave him a socket, excellent. So now he'll be able to upgrade his bow um, with a soul core to get an extra mod. Um, so that's really valuable. Um, probably wouldn't have picked that one, but that's fine, that's what he had. Um, then we've also got, uh, let's see in some other results. Uh, that one, okay, so that one just modified random mods on the item, so probably not good, not what you wanted, that's a bad outcome. Um, on the other hand here, um, all right, added another mod, 25% increased armor evasion, that's a very good roll. So effectively the theme with these things is that you're going to get random results. You don't probably want to use them on the items that you've got equipped because they're likely to potentially damage them or make them worse. Um, but there's player power that you can get from this that you can't get any other way. Um, so it's something that you're definitely going to want to be able to do as you go through the game. Now, of course, because we got to the end here, we can also ascend. Um, for this particular um, uh, one, we uh, might as well just ascend this character. Um, so there's the Witch Hunter, um, which you could pick, um, and might as well just pick a simple node. I mean. There's a basic one there, it's just culling strike, you might as well put that. We didn't actually plan to show this character class while we're doing here, so just, you know, ascending while we're at it. 
Now, um, right there, you also see there's an entrance to the Trial Master's Tower. Uh, that's like a special endgame thing, which we're not going to show you, but effectively that's the pinnacle boss for this uh, particular uh, endgame grind. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how you're going to um, expand on this. So if you go back to the start of the area, um, the keys not only have um, uh, you let you get into the trial, but they're also going to have mods on them as well that allow you to do different things. And just like the Val always have, we want to make sure that there's things that have both bonuses and downsides, um, that they have their very double or nothing type culture. So uh, this one here says sacrifice up to 10 exalted orbs to receive double that on trial completion. So effectively, um, you know, you can go double or nothing on, uh, on currency as well. Uh, but it also has minus 25% to maximum player resistances, which is a pretty nasty downside. Um, you can roll these things and, uh, and you know, uh, and, and, and uh, that, that they have some pretty interesting mods on them. So um, yeah, it's once again, it's one of those things you can specialize into end game. Now, of course, there's also uniques only available here and uh, various other things available here. So um, yeah, you're going to uh, want to do that. So those are the two trials that extend into endgame that are during the campaign. But now we want to show you how the actual endgame, sort of primary endgame system itself works. So uh, we're going to have to get a higher level monk uh, to be able to show you that. Now I'm not going to get too much into the plot of this, but this is where you're going to start in the end game. And uh, just like in POE 1, we have a thing called the map device that you're going to be using to uh, travel around. Um, but what you actually get when you click on the map device is going to be quite different. Now the storyline here effectively is that there's corruption from the beast has spread across the land and you're going to need to try and cleanse it. Now this is actually an infinitely scrolling map that goes in all directions and contains all areas you can go to. You can go to each map only one time, um, so you're going to want to, um, you're going to try and want to find uh, like, you know, interesting places to go. Now this is the primary thing to explore after you finish the campaign and there's all sorts of things to find on here. There's bosses, there's towers, there's beast corruption, there's rare areas with interesting mechanics, all sorts of in-game content that you can see these icons for around the place, um, and uh, hideouts, roving merchants, and even cities. Um, now effectively in order to travel to one of these, what you're going to do is click on it, um, and then you can travel to it using a waystone. Now these waystones uh, effectively work like maps did in Path of XL1, you can craft them and so on as well. Uh, once you've gone to the map, um, you know, uh, then what you're going to find is a randomly generated... Oh, okay, he immediately clicked the portal back, a classic mistake. Um, so uh, what you're going to find here is a randomly generated area, and we've really ramped the random generation up to 11 um, for, uh, for this. Um, obviously all the monsters here are also going to be random, and one thing I will mention is that the variety of monsters in POE2 is a lot higher, and they have a lot more interesting abilities, which means that interesting combinations of them in maps um, can really produce interesting results. Um, these particular ones are that were randomly picked here seem to be relatively simple, so I guess that point isn't that well made today, but uh, that's all right. Now this monk is effectively um, the, same oh, the, the same kind of build um, that we were doing before, um, but uh, it's a lot faster for in-game. But what we're going to do is we're going to amp it up a little bit further just to sort of see some of the kind of things that you can do uh, in in-game as well. So after we've finished clearing this pack, um, then uh, we'll uh, uh, do that. So um, let's open up this, and what we're going to do is this is a character that frees a lot of things, so we're going to add a cast on freeze gem here. And uh, what that's going to mean is every time you freeze a monster, it has the ability to um, uh, cast whatever a spell of your choice. In this case, we're going to cast Frost Wall. Uh, and then we're going to add Fortress and um, reduce cooldown to that so that we can cast them all of the time. And uh, they're going to go in a circle around the monster that got frozen. So effectively, because it's going to create a lot more frozen objects around the monster, when you use your Glacial Cascade, um, they're going to do a lot more damage and uh, explode for a huge amount of um, uh, for a, hu a huge amount of damage as well. So the goal here is to uh, cleanse the corruption of the map, and you do that by killing all the rares, and if there's a map boss, then killing the map boss as well. Now there are map bosses that can spawn in every map, but we've actually decided to not have a map boss every time you go to them, and instead you can see which areas have map bosses on the main map. What that means is, is that we've got the ability to have the map bosses be a lot more challenging, but also drop a lot more items as well, um, So because you don't encounter them uh, quite so frequently. Uh, and you can also choose, you know, do I want to do boss uh, bossing or do I want to just uh, grind maps and, and do other things? So it kind of gives the player that choice. So once you've completed the map, it'll be green on the, um, on, on the, um, in this area, and then it effectively allows you to continue to explore. Now this map is kind of somewhat randomly uh, explored, so um, you know, don't concentrate too much on that, but effectively you're going to be expanding outwards from the, uh, from, from the center. Um, now, the, of course, the other thing you can do is uh, craft maps uh, with uh, currency items. 
So uh, if we get a, uh, you know, an orb of transmutation here, and uh, we can use that on there to get um, a, uh, a mod on the item. Now the prefixes are benefits to you, and the suffixes are negatives to you. Um, so uh, this is something that uh, we've changed a little bit how it works. Um, so that means that uh, you can just get a map that's just a straight up boon to you um, if you uh, do a uh, single, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you turn it into a magic with only one mod. Um, but of course, if you turn it into a rare, you're going to get a variety of downsides and upsides, and all of them can uh, have different um, effects. So um, once you've uh, cleansed corruption from maps, um, then you can start to unlock the atlas tree, which allows you to further upgrade your progression uh, system for this thing. So here's the atlas tree here. Um, now, I've actually made... Uh, what we've actually done here is all the different types of content have their own trees. Each one of them is kind of like an ascendancy class and then um, for that content. But there's also a primary tree that you get just for, um, just for killing maps. Um, so there's a tree here for um, uh, cleansing maps. There's also a tree for killing bosses and then trees for doing other, uh, other content um, on the Atlas as well. So you, kind of really, you don't have to choose between, or rather, you can choose to do a piece of content, but you're not um, going to be losing anything from any of the other pieces of content when you decide to do them later. Um, effectively, um, they all have their own um, kind of scale. Uh, in that way. Uh, so a random example here, 20% increased magic monsters on your maps. Um, another random example, um, I don't know, 20% increased quantity of waystones found on your maps. But there's also like a, a, a keystones here, like rare and unique monsters in your maps have one to two additional modifiers. Uh, it also adds extra, um, uh, uh, extra, extra bonuses to uh, drops as well. So um, these are the kinds of things that you can um, that you can get on the tree, and that's one, uh, one of the progression systems as well. Effectively, as I'm going through the Atlas tree here, but it's also kind of the gateway to a lot of the other mechanics. So, for example, here we see a map that's got this little hand icon, and that means that there is a breach in this map. There's also the boss icon there, which indicates there's a boss there as well. So um, we know there's a breach in there. Uh, you know, if you're looking for breaches, this is where you want to go. You can effectively always see the content that you're going to be able to face uh, in in, um, in maps as you as you look around the uh, look around the ma uh, tree. And there's also going to be mechanics for adding more of them later, which we'll talk about as well. So um, uh, at the start, you'll just have to find them randomly, but later on, you can add them to maps too. So uh, let's have a look at this. All right. So breaches. Uh, so Breach is another one of the League sequels that we've done for Path of Exile 2. Um, and it's also one of the sort of pinnacle uh, like in-game content grinds that you'll be able to, um, to progress through. Breaches are effectively small fishes in reality that let you see into an alternate plane where demons roam free. And uh, touching a Breach will cause it to expand and reveal all the demons there that are lurking on that plane. Um, so uh, we're going to have to walk, unfortunately, directly there, which is going to trigger it immediately, so you won't get to see what it looks like before you trigger it. But uh, Octavian can do that uh, now. So when you trigger it, and this is a horrible location for it, uh, when you trigger it, all of these demons will start to come out of the, um, um, of the uh, uh, other plane. Um, now, as you kill the demons, it's going to extend the amount of time. Uh, if you're a very good player, uh, and you can kill demons very quickly, you can keep this going for a very long time and like cover like half the map with it. Um, if you're not as good, or maybe your build just isn't as strong, uh, then uh, you're not necessarily going to be able to do that. So um, it's very hectic. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. So it's ended already. So effectively, um, you have to try. If you're very, if you're very fast at, at kill speed, um, you're going to be able to uh, take very good advantage of this particular mechanic. Now, breaches, of course, have their own rewards, which is why you're going to want to do them. Uh, if, let's just have a look on the ground to see if we can find any. If you go back and have a look, um, did it drop any? Uh, breach splinter. Right. So one of the um, so there's a couple of things that they drop. So one of them is catalysts, and the other one is splinters. So uh, which one should we talk about first? How about the uh, catalysts? So catalysts are a reward you can get only from breach, and effectively what they do is increase the quality of specific modifiers on jewelry. So um, this one here says adds quality that enhances life modifiers on rings and amulets. Um, so effectively this is going to allow him to, uh, if you uh, use that on a on, on your ring or amulet. Um, it'll allow you to increase the, um, ad, it'll add qu uh, life quality that'll make the life mod roll on that uh, amulet go up. Um, this is an area of player power that sort of seems relatively subtle, but there's actually quite a lot to this that um, you can do. Uh, Breach also drops Breach rings that are the, one of the best ring base types because they allow quality to go up to 50, which means that you can use those as base types to create some really crazy rings um, uh, uh, for the end game as well. So that's one of the forms of player power you get from, um, from only from Breach. The other thing you're going to find in Breach that will sort of unlock the pinnacle boss are these Breach Splinters. So if you collect 300 Breach Splinters, it'll allow you to make a Breach Stone that will allow you to go to um, the Breach Domain where you can fight one of the pinnacle bosses. Now we're actually going to show you this pinnacle boss um, for this particular league mechanic just because it's nice to see one. Um, but we're not going to show you any of the other pinnacle bosses in this demo. Um, but all of the different types of league, uh, all the different types of content that we have here all have their own pinnacle bosses that, um, they can, that we can do. 
Now, this is effectively a map that's a single um, large breach, um, and uh, you're going to have to be able to race through the entire map in uh, the amount of time to be able to get there and finish it. Assault. Now, this is the domain where the demons actually live, and you can see the kind of creepy hand, uh, hand stuff they've got going on as their theme there um, that's, uh, as it gets revealed. Looks like he did it. All right, so now if we keep going here, we're gonna to get to the boss. We that dreamed, we in nightmare, we that are one. She of storm and cruelty. I need mana. Once 
All right, so that's an example of a pinnacle boss, and uh, we're not going to show you the rest of them, but that's just kind of give you a flavor for what an endgame pinnacle boss might be like. But uh, just like all of the pinnacle bosses, when you defeat them, you're going to get points for the uh, ascendancy tree, uh, sorry, not ascendancy tree, for the atlas uh, tree for that uh, particular content. So this is the breach one here. Now the idea is, is that you kill the boss, you make the uh, whole league uh, more difficult, and then you can uh, beat the boss again at a higher difficulty and get more points. So the first point here you're going to see is plus one to Twisted Domain difficulty, which is going to effectively make Breach harder. Um, it says here difficulty causes monsters to have increased damage and toughness as well as making them grant more experience to drop better items. Uh, but there's also effectively specific nodes that will give you uh, interesting changes to that league mechanic. So for example, classed hands in your maps have a 25% chance to be guarded by a pack of magic monsters. Breaches in your maps have 50% more classed hands. Uh, those things are effectively like breach chests that you find as the breach expands there. So that's like a bonus that you might choose to pick. Um, there's lots of other ones here that you could pick as well. And as I said, each of the different types of uh, content all have their own uh, trees here that you can do uh, your own stuff with. So um, that is, uh, actually wait, there's one more thing that we forgot to tell you about, and this is kind of important, um, which is tablets. Okay, right, I should have gone over that earlier, um, so we'll just do it now. So effectively, right, when you do a breach uh, in, your, uh, in your maps, one of the things that you might find, and this is kind of important, are tablets. Now tablets are items in your inventory that you can use with these towers. Um, if you uh, open your inventory there and have a look at a, uh, He's just finding a good place. Um, so when you play breaches, you might find these breach tablets. And what this does is effectively adds more breaches to maps in the vicinity. So this says add eight maps in range. Uh, so eight maps in range contain breaches, and breaches in your map spawn an additional rare monster. So if you throw, if you open a tower, it gives you this interface. You can put the tablet in there, and then when you use it, it affects the local area and adds a bunch of breaches around the place. So what that means is that all the content is self-reinforcing. If you want to play breaches, then you're going to find then you're going to find this, uh, these tablets. You're going to use those to add more breaches to uh, maps in the area, and also boost what the breaches are doing. Um, and then, which will get you more tablets, which will get you more and more, and so on. So it's effectively a way to, if you're choosing breach is the thing I want to be doing, then that means that you can um, effectively self-sustain breach uh, for as long as you want to, um, and uh, and sort of effectively turn your map into that. Um, and uh, this is the true for all the different mechanics that you can find on the atlas. You know, you've got ones here for Ritual and Expedition and uh, Delirium right there. So, um, all right, so uh, that's kind of important. So what we've covered here effectively is, okay, obviously, oh, actually, one thing I, of course, failed to mention is that, you know, there are uniques you only get from that uh, bot, Pinnacle Boss, of course, and so on. Um, there are uniques you only get once you get to the difficulty of that Pinnacle Boss up to a certain level. So, of course, once again, each endgame grind has to have a way to expand it, a way to make it more difficult, a way to specialize into it, a way to, um, you know, get uh, rewards that are specific to that. So, next, uh, let's talk about Expedition. So once again, we've done another sequel to a leak from Peewee 1. Uh, this one's Expedition. Um, the, uh, uh, we'll put, put a map in here, and just to make it a little bit easier, um, we're not gonna actually do the rest of the map, we're just gonna do the Expedition part of it. Um, so what Expedition is, is effectively there are some Kalgurans, uh, a group of people called Kalgurans, who are trying to dig up some old burial sites from their ancestors, and the goal is try to get Varisium relics that are left over from their past. Um, if you've played POE 1, the mechanic is quite similar. Um, effectively, what you're going to see is these, all of these markers here on the ground that are going to tell you whereabouts things are buried, and they're going to dig these things up using explosives. So effectively, you have to choose carefully where you're going to place the explosives in order to be able to um, get the most amount of bonus. There are also these things called remnants here that give you both uh, bonuses and uh, downsides uh, for doing them. Um, after you blow up the remnant, all the future monsters after that point um, will uh, be stronger but more rewarding. So effectively, um, Octavian's going to place down some of these uh, dynamite charges uh, in a string. And uh, then once he's done that, then he will be able to detonate them and uh, spawn things. Now he's choosing carefully which remnants he wants to use based on his build. Uh, he wouldn't want, for example, to make all the monsters immune to uh, ice because that would completely destroy him. 
Now there are lots of interesting things to find under the ground. Um, there's like chests and there can often be caverns and things like that. Um, once you get to the end game um, system, uh, the, uh, the, the, the pinnacle uh, content for this league, um, there's going to be bosses and so on um, to find and uh, things like that. Now the purpose of killing all these monsters primarily is to get these Verissium artifacts. You can see one there that says exotic coinage, um, but uh, there's various other things like that on the ground. They also have these chests that drop items. There's a broken circle, broken circle artifact, and oh look, they're unique, nice. <laughs> I, well, you might as well identify it, I don't know which one that is. Uh, let's have a look. This is just unscripted, by the way. Uh, apron of Emerian. Bleeding you inflict is aggravated, which says that aggravated bleeding does 200% extra damage, right? Cool. So this is a bleed build type unique? Actually, whatever. Anyway, um, so uh, yeah, once you've got these um, artifacts, uh, then you can trade them with the Kalgurans for various different rewards. And once again, I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into too much into this, um, but probably um, one of the more interesting ones is uh, using uh, crafting with a guy called Rog. Um, so uh, we'll do that one here just so we can have a look. So Rog effectively has a shop where he'll sell you different items. Uh, you can re-roll it using the currency as well. Um, but once you find something that you want to kind of start with, uh, which maybe you don't, there we go, um, then uh, what you can do is after you buy it, he'll offer to do various crafts. Okay, so this is an interesting one, Zebus, before you click anything. So what this is gonna do is remove all prefix modifiers from the item. So if we like the prefixes, we probably want to skip this one and not do it. So we'll, let's skip this one. Uh, we got the same one again, which is very annoying. So, okay, so I guess we just have to do it then. Um, then reroll suffix modifiers. Now, there's quite a lot of different modes here, but effectively you get various um, ability to uh, modify the item before you go. I think this one is going to turn out to be completely crap. Um, remove a single modifier with the lowest modifier level. Um, sure, uh, I guess you can just take it. Anyway, that was a pretty crap example, but um, the uh, effectively this is a crafting system that allows you to make some pretty interesting items. Um, now, the other thing you're going to get from Expeditions, other than the tablets that allow you to do more of them, is, um, what else do we have here? Um, uh, right, we'll just do the logbooks next. Okay, right, so we've got logbooks. So um, if you can get a logbook, it effectively allows you to do a like super expedition, which is like an area that has um, uh, only expedition. These logbooks have um, various mods and things as well, and uh, then uh, once you go there, um, then you can do an expedition that has uh, a lot more... Um, uh, you get a lot more dynamite to make it a much larger string. Um, so there's a lot more uh, uh, strategy in picking um, what type of things you want to uh, uh, find. Uh, also, if you uh, um, uh, there's also things like bosses and uh, uniques and like special uh, underground areas and things like that to find. Um, so there's just quite a lot of stuff hidden under the ground that you want to do. So at least find an underground area maybe. Yeah, is that one there? Okay, right. And then when you detonate it, you're going to get the string of monsters, which you can try and keep up with. Um, although I hear the balance of this league is uh, a bit wrong at the moment, so he might get he might get one shot. So we'll see. Now, as the remnants trigger, all of the monsters are going to get harder. Um, so uh, they might get pretty hard by the end, even if they're easy at the start. So rather than keeping on killing those guys, we'll just quickly show you one of the things that um, he found. So there was a sub area down here where, uh, called Hidden Aquifer. There's quite a lot of variety of different things like this. Um, I'm not sure what's in this one. Um, but yeah, as I said, some of them contain bosses. They all contain interesting rewards that can be uh, unique just to them. So uh, yeah, there's quite a lot of things you're going to want to find. So 
So like all of the end games, um, completing the most difficult content in this end game is going to allow you to get points to put in the ascendancy tree, make it more difficult, add more of them, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, um, let's go on to the next one. Oh, you might as well show the Atlas tree as well. Um, so there's an example here which makes the number of explosives to one uh, so that you only get one really large explosive rather than having to do a whole string of them in your maps. Um, maybe just a randomly interesting one. All right, let's have a look at the next one, which is Ritual. So Ritual is one of the other endgame grinds. Um, the, uh, when you enter a map with this mechanic, um, you're going to find these ritualistic circles through the area. Oh, so there's one right there. Great. So when you kill monsters inside them, it effectively grants the monsters a tribute. And so when you summon the ritual, um, all the monsters that you killed within that ritual circle will spawn again. Why does that root spider have no eyes? Oh, it's breach as well. Okay, whatever. Let's not worry about that. Now, of course, because the league mechanics overlap, you would be able to kill breach monsters inside the circle and summon them again by the, uh, with the ritual, I believe. All right, so if you, when you use the ritual, it effectively closes you off into a small area, and you have to fight all the monsters that you killed in that circle again. But the key thing is, is that there's, um, it empowers them. There are multiple um, rituals through the area. So after each time you do this, you get a, a type of points called tribute uh, that you can then spend on items. But if you're willing to risk it and uh, make the uh, rituals even more powerful, you can go to another ritual circle, kill more monsters inside of it, and then um, you'll be able to uh, make the... Like, it'll, it'll, it'll summon both the ones from this circle and from the subsequent circle as well, uh, making the rituals very, very tough by the time you get to the end. Oh, there's one last monster over there. All right. So then when you click on the ritual, um, it'll open the screen here, which allows you to spend tribute. Um, now, I don't think we want to spend too long on this, but effectively, um, uh, this is the reward mechanic for Ritual, and the more tribute you get, the more uh, things you get. Jesus Christ, why are there more monsters? Oh, the map is beyond. Wait, is that because it was a corrupted map? Okay, right. So because this is a corrupted map, by the way, um, uh, every time you kill monsters, it's, uh, uh, it's got this mechanic called Beyond, where it leaves these little orbs behind, uh, and then demons can get summoned from them uh, when, you, um, uh, when you kill them. That's just one of the random corruption outcomes you can get uh, due to beast corruption in a map. Anyway, um, right, so this is Tribute. Uh, you can buy items. None of these look particularly amazing, but uh, do you have a, um, an omen in there? No, okay, so in that way, so we've got the end of the inventory. Right, so one of the things you're going to be looking for um, for this are omens. So uh, omens are a high-level crafting um, uh, item that uh, you can use to make uh, more targeted changes to your items. So let's have a look at what they do. So here's an item here where we might like the prefixes but thinks the suffixes are crap. Um, so uh, normally what you might want to do is uh, either re-roll them with a Chaos Orb or maybe remove them with a, um, a null Orb of Annulment. But um, you can't normally choose which mod to remove. This is an Omen of Dextral, uh, sorry, of Dextral Annulment. Uh, what that does is while this item is active in your inventory, your next Orb of Annulment will remove only suffix modifiers. So if you use that um, and then use an Orb of Annulment, it'll only remove suffixes, not prefixes. And uh, if you want to remove another suffix, he's got another one there. So this is a way of kind of doing meta crafting on items that allow you to make targeted changes. And with this, you can make some pretty broken stuff. There's another one here that says, while this item is active in your inventory, your next exalted orb will add two modifiers. That just effectively is a double exalt. Um, this kind of thing is like a pretty simple one. But there are a lot of these, and they do very interesting things. So that's just a sort of interesting way of crafting. It's one of the types of player power you can get um, only from this league. Um, of course, like other in-game mechanics, there's an uber boss for this as well. And killing that boss is going to get you points um, in the... Um, uh, we don't actually have to go there, um, but uh, we'll get you points for um, uh, the Atlas Tree uh, for that league. So that's one of the other grinds as well. Uh, all right, next up we'll talk about uh, Delirium. So in Delirium maps, your mind is going to be infected by a mysterious entity known as Tang Mizu. Um, you see these mirrors, and when you go through them, um, it kind of uh, affects your mind and starts uh, creating all these nightmare creatures, um, as well as affecting, uh, kind of giving these strange uh, things for other monsters as well. So there's the delirium right there. Your life will end Chill. and you will... So as you can see, it infects your mind and you get this like mist, mysterious mist that goes to the area. 
Um, it both spawns new monsters as well as um, affecting the existing monsters uh, in interesting ways. Now the main thing you're going to be looking for in this league are called Distilled Emotions. Uh, hopefully one drops and we can have a, uh, we can show you what they do. But if not, we've got one in the inventory. Now, if you're able to keep up uh, with the uh, with this mechanic, um, then you might be able to cover the entire map in it, in which case you can get some bonuses on uh, map bosses as well. Alright, so there's some distilled emotions. We have distilled ire and distilled paranoia. Now what this allows you to do is craft mods onto your amulet that um, grant you passives from your passive tree. So if you open up the crafting window for that. So um, effectively, if you put your amulet in there, um, then uh, if you do a combination of three different uh, distilled emotions, then it will allow you to uh, get a bonus um, uh, a, a passive, um, what's it called? The um, uh, notable, notable from the passage tree. Sorry, I'm getting a little, it's going through a lot here. Um, so uh, a bonus notable on the passage tree. So that one's quick recovery. 40% increased stun on block recovery, regenerate 10% of life over um, uh, one second when stunned. Um, now, once again, this is a type of player power you only get from here, but you can also use them on maps as well. Um, so if you put them on maps, then it allows you to um, add bonus mods to, them, um, to the map in addition to the rare uh, mods that you can normally get. Um, so it's another form of juicing that you can do um, on, uh, for endgame as well. Right, so that is um, Delirium. Now, all of these different mechanics from the different endgame grinds kind of can be added with each other. If you open up the map, um, you can kind of start to add multiple mechanics overlapping with those towers. You can juice maps with, um, you know, the, the thing like mechanic we just said. You're allocating points in the Atlas tree. Effectively, all together, it allows you to really boost from the bottom of the Atlas to the top of the Atlas to really in improve the, uh, the content that you're doing um, to the point where it can get pretty crazy. Um, but there is one more, um, there is one more um, uh, uh, in-game grind, which I'm not going to really talk too much about, but it relates to that, um, uh, that, that little uh, object there. Um, so effectively, this is where the uber pinnacle boss is, and uh, we can travel to the entrance, but uh, we won't be able to actually get in because we don't have meet the requirements yet. But effectively, there are, um, uh, around the map, uh, various ways to get keys to be able to enter this area. Um, it's uh, kind of mysterious, and this is the hardest content in the game. Um, so uh, you, if you, when you play the game, you'll have to try it out. But effectively, inside this area, you will um, uh, don't actually go in there. Uh, inside, inside there, the, um, you'll um, uh, be able to fight the Uber Pinnacle boss as well. Uh, and uh, for, the, for, the, for the sort of hardest challenge in the game, um, that is uh, something that I think uh, players really enjoy. Um, so this... Um, is a sort of basic overview of how the end game works. Um, there was quite a lot of information there, um, quite a lot of sequels to leagues from POE1 as well. Um, but uh, you can sort of see, I guess, the beginnings of a system that we're going to be expanding a lot over time. Um, as we add more of these uh, POE1 league sequels and as we add more content that's uh, like uh, leagues to POE2, we've effectively got a lot of space here to be able to add as much to this end game as possible. The Atlas tree with all its different little, um, uh, 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 what you might call, you know, the, the, the ascendancy kind of cluster type things uh, for all the different content. Um, all of these things, um, you know, adding all of these things, um, uh, we're, we're going to add one every time we add a league um, to effectively allow you to scale this stuff. Um, and so that means that there is a large capability to um, have a lot of content here. So that sort of shows you, I guess, as a quick rundown of the content in early access. Even though it is early access, there's a lot of content here. There's a lot to do in endgame. Um, there's the campaign plus the cruel version of the cam uh, the first half of the campaign plus the cruel ha uh, version of the campaign. And um, all of that is, I guess, going to be coming out on uh, December 6th. So how do you get access? Well, the answer is to that is that we're going to be releasing a bunch of supporter packs um, in the relatively near future when we an uh, announce all this content. And the lowest supporter pack, the $30 one, contains a key to get access to the early access for Path of Exile 2. 
So um, if you're um, if you buy one of those, you'll both get points, which you can use to spend to buy you know whatever it is in the cosmetic store that you want to buy, um, as well as get access to PoE2. And any of our existing supporters who have spent more than I think it's around five hundred dollars, um, you know, basically the highest tier supporter pack in the past, uh, will also get access for free as well. Um, so we're expecting to because effectively. Um, you know, like it's it's a it, it is a game the size of most retail games that come out. We would expect um, like a pretty significant number of players to um, be able to play, but there's still a lot of work for us to do. Obviously, we've got a lot more content to add, um, and a lot more things to do, um, and um, you know, there's uh, a. a by the time we're finished, um, I'm hoping that PoE2 will be, uh, you know, as we get to release, will feel like it's as large as uh, PoE1 is easily. But um, yeah, that's all we have for you uh, today, and I hopefully you enjoyed it. So thank you very much.